down and have our call to worship. The Lord is his holy temple. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day as we come before you, a day that we can worship you wholly and truly, Lord. Father, right now we ask that you clear us, forgive us for our sins, Lord, what we have done against you, against one another, even against our enemies, Lord. As you have done on the cross, shedding your blood in order that our sins may be forgiven, we ask right now that we can come to worship a, tr uh, a truly hold, a holy God that you are, Lord that we can come before you. Lord, thank you for this time that we have. We pray that all that we do and say will be glorifying to your name. Let's recite the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. We don't just want to be singing for Jesus. We want to be living for Jesus. Let's sing Living for Jesus. Yeah. 
such love constrains me to answer his call. Follow his leading and give him one more time in the chorus. Right now, I'm going to have a responsive reading. It's called Our Confidence in Christ. It's kicking from 1 Corinthians, Hebrews, and 1 Peter. He himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Therefore, we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can men do to me? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, uncorrupted, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. No one can lay any other foundation than what has been laid, that is Jesus Christ. Let's all, for, all stand for Apostles' Creed. Let's recite it together. Let's begin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit it on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. For then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Right now we're going to open up this time for you, the congregation, to share. And stand up, say your name, and... All that you do, all, you, all that you say will be glorifying to our Lord Jesus Christ. I uh, went to visit D.I. and Randy in the uh, St. Francis Memorial. Uh, they're doing well. Wanted to let you know that uh, he's able to move his right foot, raise his right leg, his arm fully above his head. So. Keep praying for them. They're hoping to get into the Jewish Rehabilitation Center soon. So when there's an opening, hopefully they can get, get in. It's really close to our mission in uh, Silver. So keep praying for them. Thank you. Hi, my name's Nancy. Um, I just um, want to praise God because I have um, three co uh, a few cousins, and there's one that just uh, went to Davis for college, and uh, none of um, my other family members are believers, and so um, I've been wanting to bring my cousins to church. However, um, their father isn't, um, he's just not as open, so uh, my mom has said, like, you probably shouldn't mention it at this point. And um, however, after going to Davis, she actually, her herself, um, asked to go to church with um, a friend of hers um, there. So, and like no one said anything like she asked the friend herself. And um, first it started off with Fridays. And now um, when she doesn't come back home, she also goes on Sunday. So I'm just um, really thankful for that. Um, and yeah, so praise God. Yeah. 
us. Okay. Let's join our hearts in prayer then. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for what you, in, in miraculous way, healing Randy and, and with his stroke. And Lord, we does, there are many things we don't understand, especially the bodies that you've given to us. But Lord, we continue praying for him as he recovering, as we going through his rehab, that he can continue able to uh, be a witness for you, Lord, through this, this miracle of how you have taken care of him of perfect timing of, of, of everything in control, Lord. So we continue praying for Randy, that you help him with his recovery, and as he and know that, you know, that you are always there with him, Lord. Father, we thank you for and praise you for uh, working in Stancy, Stancy Cousins uh, up in Davis in, in ways that even though we can't, but in your ways you have able for them to uh, hear the gospel, be in touch with Christians, be in touch with a church, a body of believers, and, and we pray that they will be through that, that they may come to know you, Lord. So, Lord, it's just so, so important that we continue to be faithful in you and we continue to be prayerful to you and with all our relatives and friends. And, and, and in many ways, they might say no to us, but sometimes, you know, you work in different ways in their hearts, Lord. So we continue praying for them that they'll be continuing seeking after you, Lord. Lord, we pray that you help us as we learn to give everything to you, every part of our lives, and especially right now as we give this hour to you and worshiping you. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Worshiping isn't just uh, listening to God, sitting here very humble and, and pious and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the Bible talks, us, talks about uh, being filled with joy and singing. We're going to sing the song, Hear Our Praises.
But now we're going to ask the ushers to come forward to receive the offering. Let us continue meditating upon his word and his songs. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for always, always providing just enough for us, Lord. Sometimes we get greedy, sometimes we get selfish, but Lord, but you always give us just enough. Help us to be appreciative and learn as we give back to you in this tithe and offering that coming from our heart cheerfully, Lord. Lord, as we continue to worship you, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit can be touching our hearts, changing us into the person you want us to be, Lord, to be a follower, to be obedient, to be a disciple for you, Lord. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Today we have our handbell choir. Share with us a song called Speak, O Lord. Let's all welcome them.
Thank you, uh, Handbell Choir, for the uh, <coughs> sharing of the music. And I hope uh, the Lord has spoken through the beautiful Handbell music. And I hope He's going to speak to us too today through His message. And this past week, uh, it has been uh, tough for me because I have been sick. Um, you know, the weather changes, and, and uh, I live in San Jose. I never think, you know, it's so cold in San Francisco. So I caught a cold, and, and, uh, and the past few days I've been coughing. So you're now hearing a, a very magnetic voice <laughs> from me, and I hope I can finish this third and last sermon for today. And today we're going to continue the book of James series number 13, uh, How to Manage Your Wealth. Okay, James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Uh, let's take a look at the Word of God. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you fail to pay the workers who mow your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. And after you heard this mess, uh, these uh, verses, you may be thinking, well, thank God I'm not a rich people. You know, I'm not a rich person. But let's take a look at the Word of God. And um, there are some taboos uh, in the pulpit that uh, the preacher in a lot of churches, they don't want to touch on. Uh, they are money, sex, and power. You know, how many times have you heard a preacher preach on sex? Or how many times have you heard a preacher preach on politics, about power? And so, where do you get all those education from? If a church, we don't preach on sex or power or money, then we get you know, all our sex education from the internet, from our friends, from the James Bond movies. <laughs> and um, and uh, we, we get our political decisions, you know, not, not from you know, a, a, the right you know, um, a biblical perspective, but you know, from the presidential debates and, and, and maybe from friends. And you know, I, I received my, my ballot uh, last week on, on voting. And, and there are so many propositions. You know, you, just, you don't just listen to the advertisement on the TV commercials and make your decision. You have to do your research. You have to, to ask around, or, and, and also you have to go to, to take a look what those propositions mean before you can make a decision. And one of the taboos that we often, you know, we seldom talk about in the church is about money. Now, if money, sex, and power, they are the dominant temptations for all Christians, why the churches, they are not talking about money, sex, or power so much in the church? Well, for money, there are some wrong concepts about money. Now, first of all, the church, some people think the church should not talk too much about money, you know, because money is something about our own business, okay? The church should not interfere or involve anything about our money. And, and so, um, in some churches, now, not in Cornerstone, but in some churches, when it's a time of offering, okay, you will hear some people saying, uh, the worship leader will say, okay, uh, brothers and sisters, if you're a visitor, or if you're not a member of this church, or if you don't understand the meaning of tithing and offering, you do not need to participate. Now, this is something that we try to, to tell the people that, okay, our church is not about your money. We don't go, you know, you know for your money. So don't worry about it, okay? We, we try to give a positive image to the people that, you know, our church is not, you know, going for your money. But... In worship, that's rather ridiculous if we say something like this. Like, 
every time when Clifford or Bubbles, they go up to the stage and, and then tell you, okay, we're going to sing a song. If you're a visitor, if you're not a member of this church, if you don't understand the meaning of the song, you don't have to participate. And every time when I come up to preach, and then I will tell you, okay, we're going to, to listen to the message of God. But if you're not a, a member of this church, if you don't understand the message, you don't have to participate. You know, just play your, you know, a, 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 a iPhone or, or just stream whatever, you know, do whatever you like. You know, we don't say that. But for money, we are... We are too bashful. We, 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 just, we just, you know, don't want people to, to misunderstand the church is going after their money. But, but the fact is, brothers and sisters, the Bible talks a lot about money. And you know, Jesus Christ, he talked about 38 parables in the four Gospels. And 16 of them, almost half of those parables, teaching us how to live our daily lives. They are about money. And you know, in the four gospel, there are 2,880 verses as calculated by some scholars. And out of those 2,880 verses, 288 of them deal with money. One out of 10 verse of the Bible, of the four gospels, deals with money. And to give you some statistics in the whole Bible, 500 verses around deal with prayers. 500 verses deal with faith. But over 2,000 verses, the most in the Bible, talks about money. The Bible talks a lot about money. When you Take a look at the Old Testament, at the Ecclesiastes, at Proverbs. It's all about, you know, a lot of them about money. Because God knows money is the thing that we are always being tempted and we are always fall in how to manage our money. Now, secondly, a wrong concept is money is evil. And we have a wrong concept that you know, rich people, they are evil. <laughs> and and that's, that's really false. Because the Bible never says money is evil. It's how you look at money. The obsession of money over loving the Lord, it is evil. So the Bible never said, you know, rich people, they, they, they are evil. Okay, Jesus said, rich people, wealthy people, going to heaven is like a camel going through a needle. That means it's difficult, but it's not impossible because rich people, they have a lot of things they need to lay down, they need to give up. But rich people in the Bible, there are so many that are blessed by God. When you look at the Old Testament, Abraham, he's a billionaire in today's standard. And then Job. And then everybody knows King Solomon, you know, the richest guy in the world at that time. And in the New Testament, the one who buried Jesus in his tomb, Joseph, he was a rich guy. And also in Acts chapter 4, verse 36, it says, Barnabas, the disciple, he was a rich guy. And brothers and sisters, there's nothing wrong about how much money you have. It's that how well you manage your wealth that counts. Because one day we're going to see God and He's going to make us accountable to everything that He has entrusted us. Our time, our talents, our education, our experience, our personality, our spiritual gifts, and also our wealth. It doesn't matter how much you're having now. So when you say, well, I'm not a rich guy, well, thank God, because you can learn it little by little from now on. Then if the Lord entrusts you with more, then you can be accountable to God one day. And the Bible says it's a sin. If we do not manage well, be a good steward of what He has entrusted us. And money in our Christian's lives we have sinned 
against God. When Jesus, he was praising that poor widow with the two little cents, two little coins, putting in the offering box, it's not how much money she had. It's how well she managed those money. And number three, a wrong concept is, well, you know, money, we talk about money because those verses in the book of James, chapter 5, is all about speaking to the rich people. We are not rich people, right? Now think about when Jesus was telling the 16 parables about money and possessions. He was not telling to the Pharisees or the rich people, the wealthy people at that time. He was sharing all those parables to the multitudes who are average people, ordinary people, and most of them poor people. So money management is not only for the rich people. And in fact, brothers and sisters, we're living in the wealthiest country in the world. Now, it depends on how you calculate. But last year, now I like to do all those research, when you take a look, Last year, Forbes magazine or Fortune magazine, they tell you that USA is still the wealthiest country in the world by individual wealth. That means every individual we add together the wealth in this country, we have $48,734 billion. It's way on top of the second country wealthiest country in the world. But when it comes to financial literacy, that means how well we manage our wealth. November 18, 2015, Wall Street Journal. You can go to the website and take a look. November 18, last year, Wall Street Journal have a ranking of the world's country on financial literacy. USA ranked number one in wealth, individual wealth, but we rank number 14 in financial literacy. We're way behind Norway, Sweden, Singapore, <laughs> and even Czech Republic. <laughs> Because in America, we, a lot of people, we don't know how to manage our wealth. So today, James, he's telling us today a very important, important message is how we can manage our wealth biblically. Okay, not just ask your friends, not just through the commercials, but he's going to give us a complete guide. You know, every sermon of the James, in the book of James is a complete guide of how to practice our faith. And today he's going to give us a guide of how to manage your wealth, okay? First, accumulating your wealth, and then acquiring your wealth, your wealth, and then assigning your wealth, and then applying your wealth. Now, let's take a look. It's not about how much you have. Again, I want to emphasize that. It's about your attitude. Now, James said, your wealth has rotted and moth has eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Now, James is using the three things that in the past, that happened in the past. Okay, about food, about your clothes, about gold and silver. You know, they, they will change if you keep, you know, accumulating. Their corrosion, cor corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last day. Now, what's wrong with saving up money? Now, I don't have to ask you to raise up your hands. You, you, you have savings, right? What's wrong with it? Now, James is using a word, hoard. Now, hoarding is not about saving. What's hoarding? Hoarding is accumulating money for the sake of accumulation. That means you want to save in order to get more. That means you save and save, and then next year when you open your bank book, your savings account book, and then you look at it, oh, I have another zero at the end, and, and I'm so happy. 
and because I save more and more. Money, the Bible tells us, is not just for accumulation. We accumulate in order to circulate. We don't accumulate just for the sake of having more. And in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells a parable about the rich fool. The rich fool, he said, okay, I got so much wealth. Tomorrow I'm going to build five barns, storage rooms. I can store all my wealth into those. And then I will look at my wealth and be proud of it. And then Jesus said, you fool, tonight I'm going to take away your soul. You can't even see anything tomorrow. Last week, last time we, we talked about, you know, who holds the future. If we cannot be sure about the future, then our security should not be on how much money we have, but should be in the Lord. So what should we do if we don't hoard it? Well, we have to learn to reserve it because Americans, we don't save money at all. Now, why? You know, one out of three Americans, we have zero money for retirement. You know, Chanson, I don't know if you belong to those categories, okay? <laughs> you know, zero money, okay? A lot of Americans, like my in-laws, let me tell you the truth, okay? Before they got old, you know, they sold their house, they, they closed their business, Okay, and, and they, they, they were just poor because they said, okay, when I get old, I want to depend on the government. And so I, I give up everything, I spend all my money. No, it's because of the system, maybe, I don't know. But a lot of Americans, we are living in a now generation. We just spend all the money because we don't know what will happen in the future. So we don't want to save much money. In fact, most Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. Most Americans, they don't have even more than $1,000 in savings. You know, we, we, when we rank you know, America with, you know, among other nations, we are very, very behind you know, in, in savings account. The, the, the amount of wealth that we save for the future. Now, the Bible says we should not hoard it, but we have to save money reserve the money for future use. And the Bible talks about, in Proverbs, two times, King Solomon talks about an insect as an illustration. Ants are cre creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Now go to the ant and consider its ways to be wise. It stores up its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Why we have to save? First of all, like the ants, we don't spend everything at once. Saving helps us to avoid immediate spending. But secondly, it's very important because we don't know what will happen in the future. But we don't just save the money for the sake of saving. We save it for, for example, our children's education, or maybe in the future, medical use, or maybe in the future, like renovation of your home's kitchen, right? Yeah, Clifford. And we, we need money for, to, to do all those. And, and we need to learn to save money for future use. And the final reason is there will be, or there may be people in need in the future, not just you, maybe your family members, maybe your brothers and sisters. And with those reservation, you can help those people who are in need. And so we have to learn not to hoard, but to reserve the money. And secondly, how we gain and acquire our wealth. Look, the wages you failed to pay, the workers who mow your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Now, we have to go back to the days when James and Jesus uh, was, uh, they were there in the first century. Now, there was no labor union, no labor laws, no minimum wage. Okay, all the masters, they can go out to the labor market, 
pick a few people and work in their fields or in their vineyards. And after nine hours of the total day hard labor, the master can pay whatever he prefers. So if Clifford come to my vineyard and work, and then and after nine hours, and I said, I, I'm not satisfied with your work. Okay, I'm going to pay you only half of your salary, of your wages. And then Clifford said, no, you promised me to pay, you know, more than that. And I said, I'm going to pay you this because I'm not satisfied. And you don't have a labor union to fight for you. You don't have any labor laws to regulate. So what can you do? So a lot of those rich people, they don't pay for the workers that work for them. And James said, you make money, it's okay. But do not steal the money from other people. Do not steal. When you acquire wealth, the Bible says, well, we have to work for our money. All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Now, the Bible is not saying, okay, we have to work hard, work hard. We don't, we don't even clip the coupons for Safeway or, or we, we don't get the money back from Costco. And No, 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 we, 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 we can do that because we, we are focusing on, on working and if we spend the money, we need to spend it wisely. But the Bible is saying you can earn your money, but please do not steal it from other sources. What do you mean by stealing? Some people, they steal from the social security system. Some people, they steal from their debt. They try to avoid paying off their debt. Some people, they steal from tithing, from giving to God. You said, what? I never steal from God. Take a look at the book of Malachi. It says, when you're supposed to tithe and you don't tithe but spend on your own, that's stealing from God. Some people, they steal from the government. They don't pay their taxes. You know, like somebody who can, you know, avoid paying taxes for 10 years, right? And, and the Bible says, don't cheat and steal from those sources because you are stealing and that's not the right way to do and, and you understand why the church never advised people you know, about gambling or, or about uh, playing Powerball because when you just give out one dollar in order to bet and win 50 million dollars in one day that's not what the Bible teaches us we have to, even in investment, we have to work hard to do research, study, in order to make and acquire our wealth. Find a job. Do some studies in investments and pay your time to clip your coupons <laughs> because it's hard work. And, and don't just sit here and expect that heaven will, you know, pour down a lot of money from heaven to you. And this is not the right thing to do. And also, do not even think about stealing from others and stealing from God. Somebody may ask the Bible, if the Bible has any limit for making money, how much can I make? How much can I earn? The Bible never set a limit, never set a ceiling for how much a person can earn their money, as long as, number one, the wealth won't hurt yourself. What good will it be for someone to gain even the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? 
if you win the whole world, make all the money, but lost your soul, what good would that be? And then the Bible says, you can make as much money as you can, as long as you do not hurt other people. You know, anyone who has been stealing must stop and work and help those who are in need. You know, we, we, we don't want to hurt other people by stealing from them. You know, if you steal from God, from the church, actually you're hurting other people, right? It's the same thing. And don't do it anymore. And then, of course, number three is as long as you keep a good relationship with God. For the love of money, the obsession of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, wander away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And it's all from the Bible. And brothers and sisters, we need to take heed on those teachings. And number three, how to allocate our wealth. And James said, don't exhaust it. You have lived it on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in a day of slaughter. And uh, it's the same thing today. A lot of people, when they have money, they just spend it without really need to spend that money. So I've been teaching brothers and sisters, it's okay to remodel your kitchen, Clifford, you know, as long as you use those equipments, right? You don't just put a, 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 a brand new refrigerator or a dishwasher just to show off. You invite me to your house and they look at my kitchen, you know? You know, it's all brand new, but I never use the dishwasher. I never use the refrigerator. It's for showing off. You never do that, right? But if you need it, if you can afford it, it doesn't matter what brand or you know, what model you, you're going to use. Maybe it's a you know, $30,000 dishwasher. It's okay as long as you can afford it and as long as you can use the function. You know, some people, they, they buy a watch, the Apple Watch. It's just to tell time. If you, if you don't use other functions, but buy a Casio, and mine is only 10 bucks, okay? <laughs> Just use it to tell time. It's the same thing. But why buy an Apple Watch just to tell time? If you can afford it, if you can use those functions, it's fine. You know, just buy it if you need it. You know, I, I don't need a pair of, you know, Curry number three, whatever, generation three, to walk. You know, in Hong Kong, I've told you that I, one time I played basketball with a young, you know, with a, with, with a teenager. And he was changing his pair of shoes. He had a pair of Air Jordan at that time, worth about 200 US dollars for a pair of shoes. And he changed it into a pair of $20 sneakers to play basketball. <laughs> and, and, and so I, after the game, I, I asked him, I said, why, why you don't wear those Air Jordans to play basketball? And he said, I don't want to wear them out so fast. <laughs> you know, and, and then, so I said, why you, why you bought the pair of basketball shoes. He said, I wear them for walking. <laughs> you know, basketball shoes for walking, just in order to show off to other people that, you know, I have a pair of Air Jordan. But I play basketball with a pair of $20 sneakers. You don't spend your money in order to show off. To live in luxury, or self-indulgence. So what should we do? We have to learn to budget it, to budget our money. Now, brothers and sisters, you know that why we have to learn to budget our money? Not just because the Bible says we have to plan, we have to budget for everything. You know, the plans of the, the, to the diligent leads to the profit as Surely, as haste leads to poverty, it's very important that we have to understand all the money we have right now, they are entrusted to us by God. Maybe you will argue that, you know, I earn those money, but it is our God that gives you health 
and the opportunity to earn those money. So it's not just one-tenth of the money you have to give back to God. This is Old Testament learning from ABC. But when you grow, then you have to learn that ten-tenth of those money, of all the money, belongs to God. And you may be arguing, why? Why take all my money? You know, one-tenth is already, already enough. It's not about the church tithing. You, we have responsibility in a lot of areas in our lives. We have responsibility as a church member. That's why we have to tithe. We have responsibility as a citizen in this country. That's why we have to pay tax. We have the responsibility as a member of this city. That's why we have to pay sales tax. <laughs> and we have responsibility at home. That's why we have to pay our mortgage and we have to support our children and our family members. And also we are a member of the global community. And that's why we have the responsibility of helping other needy people. So with so many responsibilities, we really need to learn how to budget our wealth so we won't over, overspend or we won't just save the money but we don't circulate. And brothers and sisters, the Bible clearly tells us we have to first budget what should be given back to God before we can budget other things. Because it's something that God wants to test us on our faith in not depending our security on money, but on Him. And again, it's not about how much you have. It's about what we learn from the poor widow, how much she gives to God. And it's not just about budgeting. Also, finally, James said, it's also about how to apply your wealth. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Now, in J.P. Phillips, which is a more lively translation, you have condemned and ruined innocent men in your career, and they have been powerless to stop you. Money not just give you the power to spend to buy. It can also give you a real power to oppress other people. Those rich people in the past, they can pay their fines or hire a good lawyer and they don't have to go to jail. And you don't have any financial power to oppose them or to stop them. But James said, if you have money. We have to use the money wisely, apply it wisely. How? Invest your wealth. How to invest it? Like Paul says in 2 Corinthians, remember this, whoever sow sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sow generously will also reap generously. Money is for you to invest. Invest where? Invest in heaven, where we all know that, right? Lay up treasure in heaven. But think what the Bible says about heaven. For one thing for sure in heaven, we don't have cash. <laughs> and we don't have bank accounts. And we don't have Tesla or Apple Watch or Samsung Note 7. <laughs> we, we don't have those you know, tangible things. But there's one thing we are sure the Bible talks about. What will we find in heaven? We will find everyone that's saved. That belongs to Jesus Christ. They will be there eternally, like you and I. So when you invest your wealth, we're talking about invest in the life of those who have not yet believed in Jesus. 
Your money can buy an Apple Watch, or your money can invest in the advancement of the gospel. So more people can come to know Christ. Our money cannot buy salvation, but our money can help people to know about their salvation, and they can come to know the Lord. It's very simple. Like, for example, treat your unchurched friend or relative a good dinner, or you have a new kitchen, invite your friends to come who are not Christians yet, and then share with them because of the brand new kitchen, okay? So they, you have a, a topic you can talk about, and, and you can share with them, and you can tell them your, your, your testimony, why you believe in Jesus. And so it's something that you can invest in. Don't just spend the money on yourself. Well, you need sometimes, but the money the Lord entrusted you and make you accountable is to ask you to invest it. And if you still remember the parable of the unjust steward, the master said, okay, I'm going to fire you. You're a bad servant. So that guy went out and then when he's still you know, having the job, he, he, he write off some of you know, his, his master's debt on other people. Why? Why Jesus praising this person? He's not praising what he's doing, but praising for his purpose. That is, you know, he wants to make friends with those people. After he gets fired, he can go and be hired by those friends. And Jesus said, well, look at this person. This person is even wiser and more smart than Christians because he knows how to use those money to make friends for his own sake, for his own future. But why, Christians, we don't use our wealth wisely for the future to invest in other people's lives? In my conclusion, not just we have to remember all these four things, how to manage your wealth, don't hoard it, reserve it. Don't steal it, earn it. Don't exhaust it, budget it, and don't abuse it. Use it wisely. Invest in people's lives. And this is a very famous saying from Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Matthew. Do not store up, you know, it echoes the same thing James said. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up yourself treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And remember this, for where your treasure is, where your money, where your wealth is, there your heart will be also. Brothers and sisters, Today, when you leave this sanctuary, I give you a test. You ask yourself where your money is right now, where you put most of your money in. Then, Jesus said, that's where your heart is. Is your heart in his kingdom? Is your heart in this church? in this community of believers is your heart in his gospel or your heart is only on yourself let's pray together dear Henry father I just give thanks to you because you have given us so much you have given us all the spiritual gift all the time all the talents in all the wealth in our lives. But Lord, we don't want just to receive and enjoy, but we want to be held accountable to what you have given us as a good steward. So when we go back to you and, and we stand before your judgment throne, we can tell you that, Lord, what you have entrusted us we have been a good steward and we are 
faithful and kind servant for you. And Lord, teach us how to manage our wealth so we don't fall into the sin against you. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Clifford. Father, we thank you for the opportunity each week and each day to know, know more about you. We understand that you're a generous God, you're a good God, you're a, you're a loving God. Help us, Lord, to be like you, especially with the wealth that you have entrusted to us, that we might be good managers, good stewards of all these wonderful things. The food, the home, the money, the, the investments that we have. May we use that for your glory. May we invest in your kingdom. May we invest in those around us who are not as fortunate and they don't know the gospel. They don't know about church. They don't know about what a powerful, loving, forgiving uh, God that you are. Help us, Lord, to invest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mr. Barry. Thank you, Reverend Long. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Long. Uh, this is the time I worship when we uh, welcome our guests. May I uh, introduce the following person? It's a guest, Sophia Lang. May I introduce Anne Fan? Welcome. If there are any other guests, you may introduce them at this time. Thank you. Okay, we have several announcements. Uh, we rem uh, remind the college people, uh, if you have friends that are college uh, age, we still need investment, uh, not investment, sorry. <laughs> enrichment teachers, okay? We wanna give you money if you can help us enrich the students in our school, okay? That's 2.30 to 6 o'clock, okay? Sorry, money on the mind. In the midst of waters, uh, Jesus, uh, was baptized, and uh, many people were baptized to confess their faith in Jesus Christ. On January 8th, 2 o'clock, we will have the same opportunity for you uh, uh, or your friends to get baptized to make a profession of their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Um, if you like, we have uh, application forms afterwards, and you can go to, go to our foundations class and understand what receiving Christ is, and we'll show you the, the process so that you might be baptized uh, as a believer in Christ, okay? Next. Um, eight days from now, we're gonna have our Harvest Fest to reach out to the community, especially those, people, those children, uh, fifth grade and under, and their, and their families can come. And it's a free thing, there's no uh, admit, admission fee, there's no tickets to buy, there's nothing like that. And uh, we, as a congregation, would like to support this project to reach out to the children of our community and our school. And um, if you uh, actually, uh, I think uh, for the security, we still need about eight more people to just watch this, the doorways and the hallways to make sure the children are safe. So if you can help out with security, please see Lana. Uh, if you uh, choose to do something else, please see For Florence. Uh, we can still use some people to help out, uh, even for an hour, okay? So we're gonna start at six, actually we're gonna set up and everything at five. Okay, so from five to 8.15, if you, have, if you can spare 60 minutes or more, you're welcome and come help out. If you wanna party, you can wear a costume, uh, that's optional, okay? Uh, next, now some of you can't make it on Monday, so next Sunday we're gonna do some uh, 
at 12.30, uh, not right after our worship, but at 12.30, because the Chinese, uh, the Cantonese department are still having their small groups. They won't be done to 12.30. So we're going to stand around here for a little bit, get to, get to know one another. And at 12.30, we're going to go downstairs. Hank is going to direct us uh, on how to move the marble tables and the chairs into this little tiny room. Okay, all the, everything in that Romans cap, we're going to put into the little tiny room uh, so that we can have the games and everything else in there. Okay, so those of you who have a little bit of muscles, okay, uh, just stick around after worship until about 12.30, then we'll go downstairs and uh, clear out the Romans calf. All right, so that's next Sunday. Next. And here's this handsome guy again. And the message that's going to come up in the next few months is life has its limits. Okay. All right, that should do it for today. Let's stand together and sing our doxology and give thanks to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forevermore. In his name we pray. Best in heaven. Treat somebody out for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>